welcome to the Bogleheads Chapter Series. This episode was hosted by the Pre and Early Retirement Life Stage Chapter and recorded April 6, 2022. The topic was Documenting Financial Information for Surviving Spouse or Executor. Bogleheads are investors who follow John Bogle's philosophy for attaining financial independence. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as personalized investment advice. Um, this meeting is for informational purposes only, should not be construed as personalized investing advice. And it's also not legal advice. And we're not telling you, oh, you should do something this way. We're just presenting you with a, a, a pretty long list of things that you should go back, consider. This is going to take, it's a lot of things to consider. It's going to take you a while. Uh, think about how you want to do this. How do you want to document this um, for your, so what, th- what this meeting is, it's, a lot of times in the Bogleheads world, especially, there's one partner, spouse, person in, in particular that handles a lot of the finances, not at all the time. Sometimes one person handles investing, one person handles bill paying, sometimes one person handles everything. So you want to make sure if you were to unfortunately pass away, you want to make sure that the surviving spouse um, knows where to find you know, accounts, all your assets, and we're going to go over all this passwords, things like that, important documents in your house. Um, so basically what this presentation is, discussion is, is, is what you can do ahead of time to make things easier for your surviving spouse. And when I say that, it's also going to apply in situations where you become incapac- incapacitated and you a power of attorney. It's also useful in that situation where the power of attorney is going to take over. And to a certain extent, when you're the last spouse to die and, you know, your executor has to take over, but it's best mostly geared towards the surviving spouse or power of attorney. Um, so we're not going to tell you this is how you should do something. We're going to present some options and you, you're going to go back, do some, re- do your own research, think about it, make your own decisions. And um, also we want to be a little bit, oh, sorry, careful to, especially with things like passwords, you know, if if you're not the surviving spouse, you, you wanna be real careful about when you're gonna use that information to log in. You don't wanna go start you know, making transactions. You wanna, we're gonna say, you know, take care and consult an estate attorney before taking any kind of action like that. Um, and then also this is by no means a complete list of what needs to be done after death. We, although we are gonna mention a lot of things, it's mostly, like I said before, to prepare in advance before you die to make things easier for your spouse. So it's not really like a complete list of everything that the spouses should be doing after your death. Okay. Okay, so the first thing is things you can do now to make things easier later. So the main thing you wanna make sure all your estate planning documents are in order, that includes your will, your power of attorney, uh, there's a medical, there's a financial uh, medical directives, there's probably seven or eight, 10 different documents. And when, if you visit an estate planning attorney, they will have a whole packet of documents for you to uh, fill out. And you wanna make sure all of your accounts are titled the way you want and that will work in conjunction with your will. And if you have a trust set up, you may have to retitle things in the name of the trust. And you just wanna check all of your accounts, including you know, your 401ks, your bank accounts, your um, insurance, all that kind of thing. And then also check all your beneficiaries as well as the contingent beneficiaries. Everywhere you have an account that has a transfer on death, payable on death, um, bank accounts, brokerage accounts, insurance policies, you wanna check all of those. The other thing you can do is you can simplify and consolidate accounts when possible. I know I need to do that. Somehow my husband and I both ended up with like literally three or four different Roth IRAs here and there. And there's no reason why they can't be kind of consolidated uh, that'll just eliminate or reduce the number of actual accounts, which will just make things a lot easier. Uh, A a large part of this discussion is going to be, we're going to call it a book or a binder. And I'm just going to start calling it the book. Um, And it's going to have a lot of documentation that you're going to leave for your surviving spouse. Um, And we're going to, that's what the rest of the discussion is going to be about. Um, And then also, once you create this book, you want to kind of go over it with your spouse, let them know where is the book, what's in the book. Um, and then, you know, should you pass away, they'll immediately know, oh, I need to go to the book and it's gonna be, have a lot of information that's gonna be very helpful. Um, one other thing I've heard people suggest is if you've been managing your own investments and you're, you think your spouse is the type that probably is not gonna wanna, 
either not going to want to or not have any interest in managing, you may want to leave the name of a trusted friend or relative, or some people actually pre-select a financial advisor. Even if you don't already have one now, they're going to say, okay, if you want, if you decide you want a financial advisor, I recommend this person, you know, make a list of two or three that you would recommend, of course, that are low fee and uh, fiduciary and, and whatever you choose. Uh, one thing that I've heard of is you should establish separate credit cards in each spouse's name alone. It used to be you could have a, a joint account. I hear that they're going away from that and you can have a, a primary person on the account and a uh, authorized user, but I've heard of situations where when the person dies, those credit cards are just going to get shut down, even if, you know, even if you're an authorized user and you could be left with no credit cards. So, you know, that's definitely something you want to think about is establishing at least one, preferably, um, you know, Clark, Clark Howard always says you should have two or three accounts, which is true because my accounts are constantly, oh, there was, we detected some fraud. We're going to shut this down. You don't want to be left without a card. So ideally each spouse should have two in there, which is kind of a pain because to keep them active, you got to do some charges and then you got to pay for credit card. That's what I do, pay for credit card bills every month. But in the end, it's going to work out, I think. Um, you want to make sure there's going to be some cash available um, <clears throat> to pay for immediate expenses, particularly funeral bills. Um, if there's a house, you know, obviously household bills, that kind of thing. And there's several different ways to do that. Obviously, if it's a joint account, it's not going to be a problem, but um, if it's not a joint account, you could consider leaving life insurance to somebody, um, adding, adding somebody as a co-signer, putting somebody right away as a transfer on death, payable on death, and those, you know, bypass probate immediately go to that person. Um, of course, you have to trust that person to be able to use that money to pay your bills. Um, there's an issue about the safe deposit box. Um, I, I worked as a um, probate paralegal for a while, and we had cases where the person's will, either they thought there was a will or there was a will in the safe deposit box, but nobody had the key. So you actually have to get a court order um, to drill open the box or, or whatever. Even if you had the key, you had to get a court order to open the box um, if the person's name, if nobody else's name was on the box. So you want to consider making sure for your spouse is on there. And we actually put my adult daughter on ours to just make things easier later on. Um, of course, you always want to declutter your, your paperwork in your house, because if not, somebody's going to have to do that after you're gone. Consider purchasing cemetery plots and uh, headstones. My parents went as far as purchase their own headstones. They had everything engraved except the date. It's installed. It's ready to go, and they're still doing great, but they, you know, they want to make things easier. So they had that done ahead of time. Um, if you have an HSA, especially with the large balance, you want to consider you know, whether or not you want to leave a balance or you want to start spending that down um, as you get, you know, you never know what's going to happen, but you want to consider what's going to happen with your HSA. And then you want to re review the book that you make. You want to review it annually and, um, you know, update as needed. So does anybody have any kind of comments on, you know, what they did to handle any of this kind of what you can be doing now to make things easier later? Just feel free to, um, oh, Jim, I forgot to do your little, Zoom tips, but hopefully people know how to click on the raised hand icon to raise their hand. Go ahead, Lady Geek. Yeah, okay, a couple of things. Uh, first, save your chat on the Zoom thing. I will be saving it and posting an anonymized version with nobody's names in it uh, soon, once uh, tomorrow or next day to make that available. Uh, one thing, let me back up a little bit, give a bigger picture here. We're talking about power of attorney. Power of attorney only exists while that person is alive. Once that person passes, all power of attorney cease to have any authority whatsoever. It becomes part of the decedent's estate. So what, when people are clear about power of attorney, be very sure you understand that fact that POA just stops. You have no authority after the person dies with that document. Uh, a couple of minor things is that uh, if you want power of attorney for a bank, they, you probably, all you need to do is take that person with you into the bank, say, I want to give this person power of attorney. They'll find, sign a form, fight, and have a small discussion. Five minutes later, you have POA on that account. That is a very big thing. It's a very big financial help uh, to have POA when the person starts to get near death and becomes unable to uh, have cognitive uh, uh, understanding of things going on. You can step in as POA with the bank immediately. Uh, in fact, I'm doing that, with, well, I have POA, for, in fact, 
POA is good before they pass because they say there's that big area where they're not quite passed away. They're on their way, they have a medical condition and that you need that power of attorney while they're alive. I'm actually doing that for my mom right now because she, she has some issues and uh, I just signed a legal contract on her behalf to have an aide be with her in her assisted living. That needs to be a legal contract and they need, they need access to the bank account to do ACH transfer. So welcome to that. But I did all of that under POA, fully legal. So, uh, oh, I want, uh, also upon death, as soon as you uh, take everything to the funeral director, the funeral director is required to notify social security of the death. This is for fraud, for, for, uh, fraud prevention. So once that the funeral director files the form, every financial institution is notified so if they decide, if they notice that, they will lock that account. Usually what you do is you call in and say, hey, somebody died and they want the death certificate, the copy of the death certificate. Uh, but in the meantime, they already know. So you might as well be up uh, forthcoming about it and do whatever you need to do before you get to the funeral director. Uh, the funeral director gets it. Um, let's see what, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention is well, if, if you're gonna do a website, Bidsafe.com, uh, I'll put the link in the chat. Uh, because people who you designate as trusted people, you, they have to know where the documents are before the person passes. Uh, Bidsafe.com, I, I know a lot of some people do that. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of delinquent on, on signing up myself. You do not, it's run by Fidelity, but you do not have to have a Fidelity account. It is designed for beneficiaries uh, to be active after the person passes. So you put everything you want up in that site, it will be securely stored online with them. So I think uh, I covered enough. They say, oh, consider purchasing cemetery plots and headstones. Bear in mind the funeral director, if you pay a price and the price increases, I hear that they can charge for the difference. <laughs> so, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stop on that. Okay, Joel, go ahead. You got your hand raised, Joel. Oh, sorry, took me a second to unmute. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> lots of great uh, ideas. What I do uh, one tool that really worked for me is Quicken, not Quicken, the Willmaker has uh, a great form for, um, uh, for recording all this kind of information uh, and things that you would not have thought about, like your Amazon library, if you're a Kindle reader. Um, so I found that alone uh, worth the price of, of Willmaker. And uh, I use that uh, quite a bit. Um, the other thing that I do is I do mo more electronic forms rather than a binder. Because a binder is uh, not as safe or secure. Um, but I do make sure that uh, my wife uh, is able to access the, it, it's on my computer, it's on thumb drives. Um, you can take an image that's, uh, encrypted in AES 1024 and leave it in a Dropbox. So my daughter and uh, has access to that as well. And that's uh, updated uh, at least once a year. So I find doing it electronically um, a lot more efficient, especially because my book would be probably 300 pages. Um, and uh, I had a weird thing happen. Um, I was perusing YouTube and there was a little video on how to break into the safe that we bought. So those of you who have like a Sentry safe or buy, you know, buy one from Home Depot or uh, Costco, one of the lower end safes, it's fairly good for fireproof, but uh, he was able to break it in one and a half seconds. And uh, it, it's pretty amazing how easy the safes are to break in and given that book is your whole finances. I didn't feel comfortable um, just having it all printed out. So that's my little bit. Right. Yeah, I think it's totally up to everybody how they want to do it. And it's also based on like, I don't think my mom would be able to figure out how to, like, she'll type an email and call my dad, you know, would you send the email? Like, it's like, I don't think, she, but anyway, so it's all dependent on you, how comfortable you feel. And like you said, yeah, you don't want to put right out and open where a, a Robert burglar would come in like, oh, there's their, you know, um, 
So it's all up to you and how you, how you think. Um, Miriam, go ahead. What do you have to add? Yes, um, one thing about the power of attorney that many have found that the banks will not accept, many banks will not accept a regular power of attorney that is drafted by an attorney and even if it's notarized and signed. And I think that Vanguard does not. They want you to use their own power of attorney forms. Mm -hmm. And with Vanguard, the form is the um, full agent authority form. And you can also have limited agent. But if you have that with Vanguard or the similar with, with Fidelity and the other bank, your other investing companies, then you can just it's, it's easier to get in at that time. It's not, you don't have to deal with them not accepting the power of attorney. And I know that in Florida now they have a, um, a clause that is put into the power of attorney form that says, banks, if you don't accept this, then we're going to you know, get really mad and you're going to pay the price. But whether this really works or not, and who wants to take the chance, um, just go to the bank and get your own power of attorney with the bank. Okay, very good. Thank you, Miriam. Keith, go ahead. Uh, yes, good evening, everyone. I uh, was just had recently gone through this with my with my mother, and uh, a lot of great information on here. Maybe just a couple of things that that I would want to emphasize based on our experience is bring if you're going to bring somebody in, whether it's a child or a trusted friend, bring them in early, at least so they know where everything is at whether it's in a safe, whether it's online, uh, whether it's printed out and saved somewhere. So they're aware of where things are. Uh, my parents uh, passed away about four years apart, but mentally they, their progression or re regression happened at different paces. And so, you know, one spouse, one, one half might think I'll give all the information to the other, you know, to my spouse, and they'll be able to take care of it when they go. And then a few years later, it turns out that that other spouse might be, you know, uh, progressing with something where their mental sharpness is going away and starts to forget things. So I would suggest starting earlier rather than later. You know, based on, on our experience, my brother and I are both redoing our estate plans. We're putting together, you know, the binder with documentation and where things are at. Uh, account numbers, passwords, 800 numbers, you know, things like that. Because when my father did it with us, um, and then he passed shortly after, then we had about four years where we were uh, in charge of our mother's financial affairs. And if our father had not reviewed those things with us, we would not know where, where things are at. We would not have been able to find, whether it's tax returns, other information that we needed, insurance, uh, policies that we needed to include with the claim form. So I would suggest doing earlier rather than later, and you can always update it as you go if something changes, but do it while you're younger and sharper if you can, so that it's as accurate as possible, and then just go in maybe once a year and update it. And I will also say on the cemetery plots, uh, my, my parents were both planners. They, they literally bought their headstones and their headstone and their plot probably close to 30 years ago and they prepaid it so when I walked in to do this with the um with the cemetery he he looked at me and he said wow he goes your parents were really smart it would probably be three times what they paid if you had to pay today's prices and and that's a significant sum that we did not have to pay out from the estate so it is a smart thing to think about that ahead of time. Some people don't like to do that, but if you're thinking about who you're, you're giving the money to and what you're giving and how much, it's smart to prepay ahead of time uh, so that they don't have to worry about that. And, and if there's a significant increase in price, it's already been locked in. Thank you. Very good, thank you, Keith. Uh, Henry, go ahead. Um, yeah, so it's really important for anybody who moves from one state to another, that the laws with all of these estate planning documents are really state specific. And in terms of how many witnesses you need, how it has to be notarized, 
if there are certain magic phrases that the state wants to be in there to uh, have it be honored when the time comes. And even if there are ways to kind of do workarounds, you don't want to be having a mess with this in circumstances where uh, the documents are actually being applied. So uh, it's something that you may have all your documents and you're all set and you may figure, well, everything's good, whether we're in the state where it was done or where you're moving to, but uh, it's just something you want to check out. Thank you, Henry. Jim, go ahead. I just wanted to say something that Keith mentioned. Besides the planning of that uh, cemetery plots or whatever the issues are, I think it relieves the family of anguish of what mom would have wanted or what dad would have wanted or whatever, and it may even save a family fight. So anyway, that's all I'm going to say. Right, right. Okay, let's. We're going to go to the next slide. Oh, there it is. Okay, so this is all talking about the book, whether it be a paper book or. Um, online, or it could be both. Like what I do is I type it online. I mean, on my computer and then I, I print it out and put it in the file cabinet with the little colors sticky. Okay, so I'm just gonna let you know um, ahead of time what the different categories are gonna be. Um, location of original, you know, sometimes you need the original document or, document or you need to know where it is as far as a document or a key. So we have a list of those. Um, kind of a discussion on passwords codes, which can go a lot of different ways. Um, what to do first in the, you know, what your spouse should, or your surviving spouse should do first in the event of death. Um, contact, you wanna list all the contact info for professionals. Um, of course, a big category is listing all your investment financial accounts, your insurance information. Another big category is paying, you wanna make sure all the bills get paid, uh, tax returns, and then some kind of household and uh, miscellaneous. So we're gonna go ahead and just start on those. So that's basically your table of contents for your, or suggested table of contents for books. Okay, so like I said, this is not, you don't necessarily put the original documents in the book. You can, or you just say, you know, where they are. Like, here's where my, my passport is. Here, here's where my social security card is. So, um, of course, you want a very important is all your uh, state planning documents. And um, in Texas, we have, in Texas, we have something called a memorandum of wishes that is referenced by the will. And what that is, it's a list of, um, something that could like all your little, your dishes, your silverware, your kind of sentimental items that might not be of huge value. And that, you don't want to put that right in the will because that could change pretty often. You don't want to be changing your will very often. So um, you want to put, if you have something like that, you want to keep that with your uh, original will. Um, and there's different um, tra trains of thought on where you should keep your will. My, my boss, I just said I was a paralegal for an estate planning attorney. He said, put it in a plastic bag and put it in your freezer <laughs> because that's the last thing that's gonna get burned in a fire <laughs> or put it in a safe. You can, some people put it in the safe deposit box but then there's the issue of getting into it. Uh, once you pass, it might be, you might be able to get into it. So there's, you know, there's kind of different trains of thought on where you should store your original will but wherever you do, let somebody know, document in this book where it is. Um, of course, copies of any trust, if you have those, you know, where your passports are, where your original social security cards, original birth certificates, marriage <clears throat> certificates, divorce decrees, your original uh, Medicare, medical insurance cards. Very important, your safe deposit box keys, because of course, if you lose those, they have to like drill it out or so I've heard it's kind of a big hassle. Um, and now lately, uh, last couple of times I went, they have a pin. You have to have a pin number to go with your um, safe deposit box. Um, the actual original vehicle titles are helpful to have. They can always get replacements, but it's helpful to have the originals. If you have extra car keys nowadays, the car keys cost literally, what, $200 to have a, a keypad made or whatever. So you want to note the extras of those, house garage car, car garage keys, mailbox keys, and uh, some people still have paper savings bonds. Um, if those are not, you know, you may have them in a safe deposit box or you may just have them store away. You definitely want to document where those are. So this is kind of a list of um, originals of something or little keys that need to be kept track of. Does anybody have anything that they can add to that? Henry, is your hand up from last time or do you have something for this? Um, Jim, go ahead. That has something. Sorry, I missed, I, I'll take my hand down, sorry. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, PJ, uh, PJ. Uh, P-A-T. Okay, go ahead. 
Um, <clears throat> there's an electronic binder of this stuff that you can get from online. I posted it in the chat where the website is. Great. And, it, and it, it, it's like $25 or so, but it goes through a lot of these things, um, gives you guidance and whatnot to store and uh, for, and, and that, it lets your successors know what you wanted to do. Great, thank you for that suggestion. Joel? Yeah, just uh, all of the, the, the originals that you were talking about are great. My only thought would be make sure you can uh, scan as much of it as you can. Good idea. At a time as well. Yes. And just in case you can't look at the originals, uh, then you have it. Right. You just have a copy. It's better than nothing, right? Great, great idea. Um, Miriam. Yes, this is a, a story from a friend of ours. When his father passed away, uh, he and his brother were going through everything. <laughs> and they were going through his file cabinets. His father was a lawyer and had all these file cabinets and they were going through file cabinets in the house and they had all the kids going through the file cabinets in the house looking for things. And they came across some very beautiful pieces of paper that were actual original stock certificates before the days when you were with Merrill Lynch or a, a brokerage and the brokerage company held the stock that the father had actually original stock certificates and that's all they, they were. And they were in the file cabins and they were worth quite a bit of money. And um, our friend had said, what if they had just tossed them out and not looked at what, it, what they were? Now I'm not saying everybody would have original stock certificates, but your parents may have things you don't know they have. Very true, very true. Um, PJ, your hand is still up. Do you have anything to add or? Okay. Okay, we're gonna go to the next slide. Okay, this is a big area. And um, like I said, I don't wanna give advice on what you should do because there's different ways to handle things. Um, so we'll have a disclaimer here. Um, obviously you wanna have your passwords documented um, like Lady Geek was saying for your, your power of attorney, if you're incapacitated, they do have authority to, I would believe, log into your accounts and handle your accounts for you. And your server, a lot of, in a lot of cases, your surviving spouse is also on the account and would have authority to log in. Um, but other than that, if somebody passes away, you bought it, we want to be really careful about using passwords to, um, you, you know, to log into the account. We want to say, you know, check with your estate probate attorney before you do that. Um, so that, that said, there's many different ways to handle. Uh, you could just hand, one time we, we had somebody in my um, job as a paralegal, we had somebody die, we went in their house and they just had right on their desk, they had this handwritten list. Of, <laughs> uh, well, actually it was printed out, list of passwords and accounts, but then a lot of, I mean, a lot of things were like scratched through and they changed the password a bunch of times and scratched through. Um, so some of that worked. Um, you could keep it in a computer file. Um, you could use a password manager and I don't, I haven't used it myself, but I hear my dad uses one. I hear there's like LastPass, Dashlane, One Password, Bitwarden, and those are, from what I understand, they're they're relative, they're very secure and they're very very helpful because you just have to remember one password and then all the rest of your passwords are very very secure. Um, like Lady Geek mentioned earlier, there's FidSafe. I haven't used it myself, but it's a free service from Fidelity to securely store documents. If you want to uh, create this book binder online and then be able to store it with some some trusted people, your children or other people like that. Um, you can also give specific documents to only certain people. And you can also, I know I don't know how you did this exactly, but you can grant access to somebody after your death. Now also there's the whole issue of secret questions and answers. Um, that could be also another sticky situation where you don't really wanna be careful who you, you know, who you give that out to, um, but might be helpful in some cases. And then there's also the issue of, um, I found a thread on this on the Bogleheads, the two-factor authentic authentication where they send some code to your email or your cell phone. So you may want to include your, um, your your swiping pattern or your code or whatever to get into your cell phone in case you, you know, that's helpful. Um, there's also, you can also have, make sure your surviving spouse, like for, say for example, your Vanguard or your Fidelity account, um, you can also, of course, access the joint accounts, but it, you can also set, make sure that your spouse has their own login 
to uh, a lot of the accounts. You could have a whole separate login where they have their own set of passwords and that way they don't have to use yours. That's just one option. Um, there's other household passwords. There's Wi-Fi password, garage code, home security code, um, home safe combination. And it's kind of up to you how you wanna um, handle that. But these are all just things to think about. And um, one thing I do is I have kind of two passwords. I have like a base password where I have one that's used for just whatever I don't care about. It's my, um, some account, you know, that I don't care about. And then I have one that's for financial. And then what I do is for each account, I add a bunch of like some characters at the end, like pound 62. So in my document, I don't actually have the actual password. I say, it's my financial password plus pound 62. And then when I print out the document, I that's when I write on the actual, like the base password. I mean, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to like, say you have your very important password manager password. You could give, give half to, you know, one of your relatives and give the other half to the other one and say, you know, in, in, in Venom, my death, you can get together and you'll have a whole password or something like that. There's many different ways to handle things, but these are just all things to think about. Um, does anybody have any uh, input on how they handle their passwords? Anything like that? I know it's kind of a complicated situation. Nope. Miriam, go ahead. Uh just wanted to ask if anybody had ever had any problems with this when they were dealing with um, their relatives passing away. Was there ever any problem um, with passcodes and, and passwords and um, you know account numbers being falling into the wrong hands and being used? Well, I had the other problem is I couldn't get access um to my late wife's email when she passed and that caused no end of havoc um, so definitely important um, after that bogleheads thread i did shift to one password and i've been very happy seems like a really so, so I'm, I'm an advocate for a password manager uh, especially like one password where you can you can also store you know copies of files and you know, scans and stuff. So it becomes a much bigger repository uh, than just uh, passwords. Mm -hmm. It's sort of where everything is. I was just wondering if we were overdoing the concern. I think it's probably not overdoing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you might be able to navigate through some of it, but I could not get... Uh, for instance, Google to, to, to get me access to my wife's account, even with a copy of the death certificate. The other thing I would add is many password things require two-factor and you better know your passcode of your partner's phone or uh, have access to their fingerprint or facial recognition, which could be obviously problematic, but uh, you may not be able to get into certain accounts. Okay, that's a good point. Um, Alan, go ahead. Yes, uh, I don't know about other email programs, but uh, Gmail allows you to set up a trusted contact that would be notified if you have no activity on your account after a certain period of time and would grant them access to your Gmail account. I presume uh, uh, Mac, you know, uh, iPhone and so forth probably have similar type uh, abilities as well as other social media whether you're on facebook and other social media to possibly have a uh, designated trusted contact it's great to know a uh, bostonian oh i was wondering if uh, anyone has done a dry run so you have a let's say a solid plan together um and then you say all right assume that i'm dead can you try and get into everything can, can you try and get access to everything, execute the plan like you would if I were not around, just to see if the, if the whole plan works? Do people do that or do you do your best and you hope? Are you saying like test, pretend like you're dead and just test it out to see if people can, is that what right. you're saying? Um, right, so if my spouse has to do it, like, I am not here now, you try out, like we have a plan <laughs> together. And if something fails, better, better know now than later. 
That's a good point. Yeah, that's something to think about. Um, Someone told me once where they forced their spouse to do the uh, books or numbers once a year so that they have to exercise their way through the checkbook, the brokerage accounts, whatever. That's not a bad idea at all. Probably something. That's a good idea. Probably, yeah. Uh, Doug, go ahead. Um, I was going to, uh, I guess, third, what the other previous two people said is training. And um, what's it, what, what sounds right? Twice a year? Does that sound good to get, go through from start to finish, pretending like you're dead? I think that's too, about right twice a year. Twice or maybe once a year might be enough, but yeah, twice a year is good. Depends on how long it takes, I guess. <laughs> okay, uh, we're gonna go to the next slide. Okay, so this is a list of the information that's gonna be helpful pretty quickly. There's some things you can wait on, um, but there's some things you wanna do, you know, the first couple weeks. Uh, so first of all, you wanna have a list of people to call and contact. Um, my parents have uh, a lot of this book is actually based on what my dad put together and they have a whole list of, you know, people, I think they have their email addresses and their phone numbers. I'm, I'm sure they would call everybody personally, but um, another way to do it would be to actually type up a list of emails um, and then mail that list to your spouse or whoever. And then they could use that at the time to either copy and paste individual emails or do a whole, uh, blind carbon copy where you just have to send out one and it kind of depends on if you're if you're good friends with that person if, if your spouse or child who's taking over knows that person they may want to write a little personal note but if they don't they may not want to have to do this 100 times you know and send out 100 different emails um or phone calls whatever you want to do um and as alan you mentioned earlier in the chat you could pre-write your obituary and my my mom did this and the reason she did this she's like you're not going to know like my dad had military service. You're not going to know the dates and when he went to Korea and this and that and what, you know, what, what his unit was, you know, I'm not going to know that information. So she kind of put together and she may had make sure all the relatives names were listed correctly with the spouses and um, made sure all the, you know, a lot of times you list like your educational information, military information. And you know, a lot of times you don't know details of that kind of thing. So um, you may not want to write out the entire obituary and say how great of a person you were, but you may want to list some uh, details that, you know, the other people may not know. Um, so you definitely want to list your, your wishes as far as, you know, burial, cremation, church service, who you want to be your officiant, favorite hymns, that kind of thing. Um, it, whether or not you have a prepaid funeral policy, whether or not you have a, either you already have a cemetery plus purchase or you, you have a preference for this particular cemetery, this particular kind of headstone, all that kind of information is very useful, of course. Um, you may want to collect uh, military benefits as far as, um, and I, I'm not real familiar with this, but my dad, he was a, a Korean War veteran, and he said there's some kind of special medallion you can order, or you get it for free, and you put it right on your headstone. So I knew uh, something about that, and you may be eligible to be buried in, um, what is it called, VA, VA National Cemetery in, Ar is it in Arlington, or yeah, Carol, my father-in-law passed away. He was a um, Korean veteran also, and he uh, chose in advance this uh, the military ceremony. So they had an honor guard. It was really nice, really, really nice. And he was interned, although he was cremated, they have both in the ground cremation and above ground and in these columbariums. It was just beautiful ceremony. He would have really liked it. The other thing we did, um, which I recommend, is we wrote a personal obituary that we had people fill in paragraphs. This was not for the newspaper. This was for internal friends and family that included uh, funny stories and vulgarities and all sorts of things that you could never put in the newspaper. You didn't want in the newspaper. So it was, it was actually two versions of the obituary. Nice, nice, very nice. So one of the things you probably want to do right away is uh, inform and collect on the life insurance because that's usually pretty quick. From what I hear, you can get that pretty quickly, uh, assuming, of course, you're going to document later who, who all the beneficiaries are and what the name of the company is and that kind of thing. Um, inform Social Security. Of course, the funeral director would do that. Uh, if there's any pension, you want to inform them. Um, and I, from what I understand, if Social Security will take back because they always pay on the first of the month. And if you say if you died on the second, they'll take it back, is from what I understand. 
So just be prepared for that. Um, you want to obtain multiple death certificates from what I understand 12 or even 20 is not too many because a lot of places are going to want originals. Um, and you don't have to do this like right away usually, but you may want to consider going ahead and contact a probate attorney and start the process. There are certain deadlines. For example, um, nine months if you want to elect the estate tax portability. From what I understand, there's a nine month deadline after the death to do that. Um, and then also if, if you don't already, if you're not the spouse and you don't have access to the house and things like that, um, you, you probably you know, wanna go ahead and start that process um, pretty soon. Um, you also wanna transfer and collect any accounts that the surviving spouse was named beneficiary of, uh, for example, IRAs, 401ks. And I don't know enough to know the details, but I know there's a certain way you have to title the IRA to be able to have the the full benefits of, um, you know, extending the RMDs and things like that. And I did put a link in there on how to, how to title um, the IRA as you transfer it over. And then also there are certain required minimum distribution deadlines that even after a person dies, from what I understand, you have to meet those or you have to pay. It's like a 50% penalty. It's a very large penalty if you don't take out the RMDs when you're supposed to, I think even if that, even after somebody dies. Uh, of course, one big thing is you want to continue to pay monthly bills, and we're going to have a whole page on that later. Um, and then these are kind of things where now we're getting to be a little bit later, where after the accounts have been transferred, you want to check on, uh, you're going to have to name beneficiaries because it's going to be in your name now, and you want to double check all your beneficiaries. You're going to want to notify credit bureaus and uh, Department of Motor Vehicles so they you know, know your driver's license so you don't have identity theft. Even after your death, you can have identity theft. Um, then the surviving spouse is going to want to check their existing state plan documents. Sometimes they'll still be okay if you took care the first time to name all the contingent beneficiaries. It still may be perfectly fine as long as you have, like usually people put their spouse and they put one of their children as contingents um, for like the power of attorney and things like that. So that may be perfectly fine. You may not have to redo that, but you just want to check on that. And if you've left um, emergency contact information, for example, with doctors, you'd want to get that changed. Um, and then you also want to think about your spouse may want to um, attend a grief support group if you happen to know of any. Uh, you may want to go ahead and have that contact information handy for them. Um, does anybody have anything they want to add? Um, Jim, is your hand still? Jim, oh, your hands up, Jim. All right. Okay. Lady Geek. Oh, interesting. Brings back a memory of some uh, interesting experience. Uh, well, first, when you say death certificate. The only original death certificate is the one filled out by the medical person at the at the person at, at the time of death. Everything else is a copy of a death certificate. I had a problem where my father passed away before a medical person could, he, he, he was at home, but the hospice nurse didn't arrive in time. So he passed away and she says, I can't sign off on the certificate because I wasn't there when he passed. I ended up calling Philadelphia 911 explain the situation to have someone have, have a uh, EMT guy sign a death certificate. And after he, then he called the medical examiner to, cause they didn't know that it's police coming to the house. Did this guy, was, was there a crime involved? So I actually had a copy of the uh, doctor's report a few days ago saying he was in terminal stages. So they say everything. So when you say you get a copy of a death certificate they say there's one original filled out by the attending physician or medical person. If they're not present. The funeral home will not accept the body. I had to wait two hours and get all this stuff straightened out with the Philly EMTs before they would even come and take the body. So just, to, just to, if somebody passes, make sure they're in a medical facility. Um, uh, but the other, the other, yep, yeah, okay, yeah, hello. The other <laughs> thing was interesting. I don't know if anyone else would experience, but only a vocal head would do this. When my husband passed, uh, it went, well, I said, I made arrangements for cremation uh, for his funeral while he was in the nursing home. We made arrangements. The guy was an insurance agent. He sold me a, an, a, a funeral insurance policy. Like I said before, they can increase the costs and you have to pay for it. So he signed, I said, I said, I talked to him. Are you an agent? Oh yeah. You getting a commission for this? Yeah, it's only like 40, 30 bucks. Okay. So I signed it and I checked my account online. My husband passes. I look at the value of the policy. It increased sixty dollars. The value that so he's going to get paid sixty dollars more than what he charged me. So I go in, I go in with with the policy copy, 
and I needed some death certificates. I horse traded. I showed him the policy and said, yeah, you know, your policy is like $60 more now. Can I have it in cash? <laughs> so I, I negotiated with the guy to get three copies of the death certificate. The prices are set by the state in Pennsylvania. It's $20 per copy. So I got in, in exchange for that, I, I basically negotiated uh, three, three free death certificates because of the life insurance policy. So I just felt I got something out. I just had fun in negotiating, but at your husband's death, but it, it was just bugging me that because of the insurance. So I say just read How many do you story. typically need? How many did you end up using and do you need? Oh, that's, oh, that's nothing. My husband was also an army vet during Vietnam and stuff, but we, and there actually is a VA cemetery within commuting distance from, from, from our location. Uh, but we chose cremation to say, well, I, I could have opted for a free VA funeral and burial, but we didn't go that route. Uh, I usually said like 10 and also the VA will supply free copies of the death certificate, by the by. So, uh, I, they said, how many will they give you? They said 20, he said, give me 10. <laughs> so I, uh, I still have a few extras. So, uh, I'd say, but we had no complications, but I thought 10 was a, a minimum number. And half the time they just wanted photocopies anyway, like Vanguard or, or whoever else I was doing it with. Oh, and social security, they gave it back to me. Uh, yeah, also a file for the social security death benefit of 255, $255. Uh, it's something. So, okay, that's why I just thought I wanted to relay that interesting story that yes, I'm a vocal head and I negotiated at my husband's death over, over an insurance policy. <laughs> okay, thank so. you, Lady Geek. Okay, uh, PJ, go ahead. Yeah, I had um, a recent experience <clears throat> after my mother paid, passed. Uh, the beneficiary IRA was held at Franklin Templeton. And then in the end of uh, 20, I moved it to our other ones in Fidelity. But somehow the uh, RMD was forgotten as part of the going over. And then it wasn't recognized until... Uh, a week ago when I was doing my taxes that I didn't have an RMD. So I wound up having to go through three people at Fidelity and they actually have a group that does this. And uh, it all got worked out and the penalty is 50% of the tax. Um, but there is a, uh, you can request a waiver of the tax uh, and have to provide a letter of a reasonable cause and mine was that uh, it got transferred and got missed. So this was the first year that Fidelity had it. And it got, you know, I called them on Thursday night. I talked to the retirement uh, specialist Friday and it was executed on Monday. Um, and now I, I just had to draft a letter that, to include with my uh, income tax submission this year. So even though it was all done right, it got screwed up when you, tried to consolidate into everything at Fidelity. Okay, thank you. Um, Jim, your hands up. I, I just wanted to point out on the VA stuff, one more thing is I know somebody who interned at cremation remains or crema uh, I forget what they call it, cremains, I think they call it, uh, five years or 10 years after the death of the person. So uh, the other thing that they do is they provide the wife or husband or partner can also do that. You'd have to find out from them, but they'll put two names on the headstone. So the, the person who served to be on the front, it'll say, you know, Korean war and on the back could be the spouse. Good to know. Good to know. Joel, do you have your hand up? Yeah, boy, I just had a brain uh, thing. I'm trying to remember what I was going to say. You want me to call on Lady Geek and then you can go next? Yeah. Or? Okay, Lady Please. Geek, go ahead. <laughs> okay, it, it just from what, what the Jim reminded me of, because my husband was a vet, he was entitled to a free urn and a free flag <laughs> uh, as part of, part of the funeral director. And uh, so he gave that to me. I mean, the urn was, he said it was worth $300. Okay, with nice wooden urn. I did something else with the ashes, but um, they were scattered elsewhere. But yeah, I, yeah, I, I sound like I'm making this fun, but it was a horrible experience to go through. And when you're upset and angry, you tend to just be very uh, vocal and just expressing yourself. So I say, yeah, it was a really bad time for me. But I guess just by negotiating with the guy, I was just kind of letting, letting myself vent. 
Uh, and also, by the way, in hospice, you do have uh, bereavement counseling. I did go through that process and that was actually very, very helpful. So if anyone is on hospice, please take up, take them up their, their offer of bereavement counseling. And that can be done while the person is alive because it is a process that's about to happen. So please take advantage of that. It is free, supplied by the hospice and for a period of 13 months after the death for, for, for close family members. So, okay. Okay, very good, thank you. Oh, good to know. Joel, did you remember what you were gonna say? I did, I did, sorry about that. So as part of the estate plan, um, what I do is I keep a, a spreadsheet that's sort of tied to my automatic updates that splits out every account by the beneficiaries. So they can easily, you know, whoever manages my estate, my wife or daughter, you know, can easily sort of see at this point in time, you know, uh, Joe gets 10%, Frank gets seven, uh, Esmeralda gets 20, charities get this. They can see a, a, a spreadsheet that's real time with all of that information. And then I also gave sort of instructions for each of the inheritors on how to assume the account. So like I would want my wife to, to make uh, her, the IRA or her own, um, whereas my daughter is gonna have a 10 year stretch and here's the suggested way of going out to, to get it. Um, you know, one tenth in the first year, one ninth in the second year, one eighth in the third year, and so on and so on. And I, I'm not sure if that's gonna be helpful or not, but it, it, I'm a little ADHD in terms of planning. It made me feel better. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, Keith? I was just gonna add, um, you know, something to document for, for, you know, the person that survives if you pass is reoccurring charges that are either happening on your credit card or maybe being taken out of your, your checking account. Um, we had several of those when we went through it with my mom and dad, and it was hard to get those turned off. They, they wouldn't accept that. You know, we were calling to say they needed to be turned off. They needed death certificates sent to them. Sometimes if it takes a while, you can be charged for something that's no longer necessary. So if you're putting together a list of things for your, your surviving spouse or whoever beneficiary to take care of, you know, that's something that, that uh, they wanna understand what needs to be turned off uh, uh, you know, immediately after your passing and how they're able to do that. Cause that can be, you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars a month. It can be anything from Netflix to, to an antivirus program and any, anything in between that 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 person that passed away was being charged for that's no longer needed. So you wanna make sure that you document those things so they're not sifting through your, your, your charge card looking for them and also that they know how to turn them off. Okay, great. Um, Doug? Oh, you're, you're muted. I, I don't know if this is the right time to talk about this right now or, or if it's going to or if it's going to come up later but um what do you do in the case of a uh, elderly parents who aren't doing any of this due diligence i'm not sure they have any planning at all or, and you know and you you know you're they may not have that much longer you're going to be faced the big mess to clean up does anybody else have that problem somebody um i don't know if he, it could have been you somebody submitted that as a uh, you know comment on the rsvp and i don't have a slide for that however i did put in quite a few uh, links on different articles, books, podcasts, and um, that kind of thing. So let's talk about that when we'll talk about that. Um, if anybody has any suggestions, I don't personally, but uh, when that slide comes up with the links, we'll, we'll talk about that. That's, a, that's definitely an important thing to talk about. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. Let's see, whoops. Okay, this is a real short one. Um, just a list of contact information for professionals. So while on the first slide, we had contact information for you know friends and family, that kind of thing to inform them. But this is uh, people that you may have to work with, your, spot, your surviving spouse may have to work with, uh, probate attorney, the one that drafted the wills, and then it may be the same or a different attorney that you recommend. You may have one picked out that you want to probate, probate the estate. Um, 
And then any kind of other attorneys use, like if you have a real estate attorney, a business attorney, anything like that. Um, if you do use a tax preparer or a CPA, you want to obviously you have that contact information, financial advisor, if you have one, uh, or if you don't have one, but you may, you know, you want to have one listed for your surviving spouse if they feel they need one um, and any kind of insurance agents. Is there anything I left off this list as far as uh, contact information for professionals? Can anybody think, Keith? I just wanted to, to add again, based on personal experience, uh, my, my uh, parents had worked with an estate attorney for many years and also had worked with a, a CPA for probably 20 to 25 years, I literally became a family friend. And when my mother passed and we had to sort everything out, we, we leaned on them pretty heavily for a number of things, whether it was documents that the attorney had uh, in his files or the CPA that was able to help out with things because of the knowledge that they have. So just from my experience, uh, that was a huge help and well worth the additional fees that we had to pay for their consulting or whatever you want to call it. I, I think it would have taken us probably twice as long to get through everything, and we might have made some what could have been costly estate, uh, costly mistakes without that, that help. And that caused me to say that I wanted to have something similar because uh, I'm the one that handles the financing. If something happens to me, I want my wife to be able to have somebody to call to say, can you help me? I don't understand this between her and uh, whoever is helping her to do this. So I think, although I know Bogleheads typically like to do everything themselves, they don't like to pay fees and expenses for other people when they can do it themselves. I will just say from my experience, it was very, very helpful and well worth the money to have these folks involved for a lot of uh, complicated questions and, and help that would have taken us a lot longer. Okay, great. Thank you, Keith. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is kind of a big topic. Um, you, of course, you want to list all your um, investment and financial account, accounts because if you have um, more than just a couple, your, your spouse may not know where everything is, or of course, you know, a power of attorney, agent, or anything. Um, and I'm going to say a disclaimer, you know, be Take care, do not perform any transactions after death without consulting an estate attorney. Um, like I said before, someone, suggest, someone suggested to me once that you should pick a trusted relative or friend to kind of help your spouse in addition to like any of the, the um, professionals that you're gonna, your spouse may need. Sometimes they just want a, a point of first contact and this could be like a trusted uh, friend if they're just totally lost, like I don't even know what to do first or I'm totally overwhelmed. Uh, you want to, it's a good idea to have a trusted relative or friend uh, picked out to kind of help your spouse with, your surviving spouse with that. Uh, one thing that's good is to just have a printout of your, all your accounts, your net worth, just so that your spouse knows, oh, here, you know, just get an overview of all your, all your different accounts. Then of course you want to list, you know, every single account, bank accounts, online banks, um, safe deposit box, whose name is on the box, which physical bank branch, um, you know, where the key is, we mentioned this earlier, the pin. Uh, and also you may want to kind of list what is in there. You know, do you have, do you have savings bonds, car titles, so that person knows, oh, if I want to get the car title, it's in the safe deposit box. Um, of course, you want to list all your investment brokerage accounts. And it's not a bad idea to print out maybe once a year, just the recent statement will have all the, you know, list of the assets and the contact information for the uh, institution on there. Um, of course, all your retirement accounts, IRAs, Roth IRAs, 401ks, uh, if you have an HSA, list of savings bonds. Some people may have savings bonds, paper. I know I have paper bonds and a treasury index account, um, which are, of course, very hard to get into. <laughs> people can't even get into their own accounts, much less somebody else's, right? Um, pension, if you have any college accounts, 529s, Coverdells. Listing real estate, of course, your spouse is going to know, but just you may want to have a copy of the deed in the mortgage, your primary home, second home, rental homes, land, mineral leases. Um, you may want to actually list. And if you don't have a mortgage, you may want to list. I think I had this on the other side, but you may want to list that because you may assume there's a mortgage and all they're trying to find it. Oh, but it's paid off. So you may just you know make a note if it's paid off. 
if you own a business, you know, I don't know anything about this, but you know, might have certain um, business documents um, that you may want to include information there. Um, and these are some kind of newer things, um, digital wallet services that have a balance. I mean, you could have $500 in your PayPal account, Venmo, Cash App, that kind of thing. Um, I know nothing about this, but cryptocurrency, you may have a cryptocurrency wallet somewhere that has a lot of money in it. Um, um, like I said, you could, you know, maybe print on a statement uh, or at least download it to a place on your computer that's referenced, you know, statements or at least where they are. So they have a general idea, you know, what's in the, um, oh, did I accidentally? Um, and there's a reference to a thread later, or I think maybe it's a wiki page or a thread investment policy statement, just kind of like a rationale. This is, you know, this is my, this is our asset allocation. We've got 60% of stocks and 40%. And then you may want to kind of explain why, so that when you're, if your spouse, say for example, they may they may employ a financial advisor. This would be a good thing to have. We've always we've done it this way, and this has worked for us, you know. And then maybe you're planning to change your asset allocation as you got older, that kind of thing. Just your your rationale, how you've been doing your withdrawals, your withdrawal policy, that kind of thing. Um, let's see. And then location on your any location on your computer of files that might be helpful. You may have. Um, uh, like I have a file where I have all my dividends that are coming in from different places. I have every quarter I have the list of dividends and that way your spouse knows, oh, I'm going to expect a dividend in, in a month and that's going to be helpful for me to have that cash flow, that kind of thing. Just any kind of spreadsheets you have, you may have estimated tax spreadsheets, net worth statement, something, you know, just put the um, location of the file on there that might be helpful to them later on. Joel, do you have a input on this slide? Yeah, we did a wiki for, called a retirement policy statement yeah. that kind of takes it one level above an investment policy statement that kind of help, describes how retirement's supposed to work and what the goals were and how the money flows, how you get paid every month. That might be a, a, a useful thing. Perfect. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that the surviving spouse would want to take to the, if they decide to hire a financial advisor, that's exactly the kind of information that would be very helpful. Like. Um, for that kind of purpose. So, um, anything else? This is a pretty important um, as far as, you know, it's so easy to, to miss a little account if you don't document all of them. You know, your spouse very well may not know, and then you may never get anything in the mail if you're on paperless uh, system. It may be going to some email somewhere, and they may never know. Even if you may have your tax statements going to paperless, you may never get anything in the mail. So kind of important to document every single account, even if it's even a small, you know, a couple hundred dollars or whatever. Um, Joel, did you have another comment as your hands may, or may still be up? Lady Geek, go ahead. Just one thing, uh, financial mortgage and also car title. Do you have a car title, let's say, or, or, or car loan? Uh, Right, yeah, I didn't mention. I did not mention car loans. Um, that's a good point. You, you yeah, you definitely want to list um, debts as well as. I think I have mortgage is in the bill. There's a whole section on bills, but I, I didn't actually put car titles, car loans, but the mortgages. Yeah, in. actually, if you lose a car title, a notary will get you a, a replacement, so uh, it's easy to find. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, you want to document, of course, all your insurance information, uh, you know, list all the types of policies you have, whether it be um, homeowner's umbrella, you may have a boat policy, of course, auto, uh, you may have several different life insurance, you may have one from your provide, uh, employer, hopefully you have one, or if you had one at the time when you were younger, you may not need insurance, life insurance when you're older, um, one outside of your employer, so you may have two or more, um, you may have long-term disability, long-term care, um, several different types of medical, dental, me Medicaid, Medicaid supplement, prescription, those, all those kind of policies, um, annuities, I guess count as insurance, and of course, prepaid uh, funeral arrangements. So you just wanna list what types of policies you have, uh, what's the insurance company, agent name, contact information, if you have that, um, dollar amount on the policy, if there's, you know, for life insurance, that type of thing. Oh, of course, who the beneficiaries are is important for, life insurance, that type of thing. Uh, Guri, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I have nothing useful to say, but I wanted to share uh, 
humorous quote from Charlie Munger, which is, all I want to know is where I'm going to go, where I'm going to die. So I'll never go there. <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> Doug, go ahead. Well, I, I think part of the final instructions ought to be to have the surviving person log into your email account uh, at least once a week after you're dead. Good point. Because yeah, you're going to have stuff and for the next year, probably once a week for the next year, because you're going to have stuff coming there, you know, uh, regarding insurance and who knows what else, brokerage information. But that's a very good point. And if you don't log in, eventually after like six months, they could actually sh delete the whole account if you don't log yeah. in. So it is yeah, that would be really right? bad, right? <laughs> to log in uh, periodically. Yeah. Um, it's kind of the same thing. Like you're getting you're getting your mail, but now nowadays a lot of times you don't get mail, so you you know you, you got to check in the email because there could be some very important, you know, text forms or all kind of things in, coming into the email. Lady Geek. Okay, on, on bank, bank back to banks account uh, bank accounts. Uh, if while the person is still alive and you have a joint account and the person passes, do not close that account. It depends on the bank that each bank follows the uniform commercial code for the state and it's up to the bank to decide, but you can deposit checks made to your deceased spouse if your name is on that account. Uh, it is legal and the way you endorse the check is for deposit only that is a legal endorsement you do not have to for you never have to sign a check actually unless you want to cash it. For deposit only is a legal endorsement. So if they make an account to like, uh, I, I, every once, a, like once a year, I've been getting a couple dollar checks because my husband's had something that spits out a dividend like for a couple dollars and I can't kill the thing. Uh, I can't get rid of it. Uh, that's another story where I have to file probate. I didn't file probate in this one county in Western Pennsylvania for some royalty thing. And they have to, I have to file in that county. It ain't worth it. So uh, and, it, and it's at least below the amount that he has to pay taxes. It's like a couple bucks. But the thing is, it comes in his name. I say for deposit only, it goes into my joint account. Uh, and it's his income. <laughs> so they say, but it depends on the bank. But so my, that's why I have a local service bank. They do that for you. So it's very important. Otherwise, you'd have to set up an estate checking account, which is a whole nother thing that I can go through. On life insurance. A lot of times you don't know if you're the beneficiary, you don't know if this person even had a life insurance policy. How the heck, believe it or not, insurance companies want to find beneficiaries. When a person passes, they really do want to try very hard and give you your money. So if I have a wiki, I, I put a link to the wiki's life insurance uh, article in the chat. I, I did it earlier when I was talking about it, but in there, there's a way that you, there's a search that you can do for free how to find if the per, if this person has a policy. It is well worth it to go through that process. Additionally, you don't know if that person has any unclaimed property. You know, they say unclaimed freight or whatever, but one thing that actually that policies, um, if, if, the insurance pol if the insurance company cannot find the beneficiary, that money goes to the state as unclaimed funds. Mm -hmm. So, and also other things go into there, like somebody sent you a check like 20 years ago, they couldn't, it was never cashed. That goes to the state's unclaimed property. I've got a couple of bucks that way too, oh, searching for my own name. So search unclaimed property for yourself first, and then for this person who's deceased next, and you might, you might get a hit. You, you never know, it, it's, you, you never know. So I just wanna say something about life insurance. Okay, I'm done. Very good, thank you. They're all good suggestions. Okay, let's see what the next slide is. Oh, <clears throat> okay, this is an important one, bills. Because of course, especially if you're living in a house, you definitely want your spouse to be able to keep the electricity on, that kind of thing. Um, so you wanna know, let them know, obviously if they don't know where the checkbook is and the if you have a whole box of spare checks, um, I don't know where those are, uh, you wanna list, all the bills, how it's normally paid, whether or not, oh, you get something in the mail or you get something from the email, which is usually the two ways um, that you pay bills or sometimes they're automatically uh, paid, but you usually do get an email notification that, of the amount or whatever. Um, so the types of bills you wanna list, of course, credit cards, utility bills, insurance bills, mortgage. And if you wanna state, if you don't have a mortgage because somebody might not know might be looking for your mortgage when you don't have one. Um, 
property tax, cell phone service, cable streaming services, um, digital subscriptions, <clears throat> home security, fitness center gym, any other online services. And uh, there are some that you would want to, you know, you can let your spouse decide, but if you, if you were into genealogy and you had, you were spending all this money on ancestry.com, they probably, they may not want, they might, might want to cancel that right away, but they may not want to cancel the, the cable service, the streaming, the, you know, Netflix or whatever. So they can decide, um, but you should at least list them. And then if you've forgotten a few, they can, it'll probably show up on the, the monthly bill and then it's be like recurring expense. Um, one thing I was looking at today was um, if your spouse just, seems overwhelmed with the thought of having to pay the bills and figure all this out. There is something called a daily money manager, and this is a nationally certified professional. Um, I've never used one, um, but there's a website you can go to to find one in your area, and they do, they are certified to be fiduciaries, and they have to have a certain amount of education and um, exams. So that is an option. They basically can pay your bills, organize all your finances, you know, get it together, your tax information, that kind of thing. If, you know, for some reason your spouse is just overwhelmed and just, you know, can't deal with that kind of a thing. So that's just an option that I wanted to mention. Okay. Does anybody have any, uh, Doug, go ahead. Yeah. If, you know, if you've been doing all this stuff, let's say for 30 years and your spouse has not touched any of it, it, they will get overwhelmed. So I think this is a, something that you've got to take over if you're especially getting towards, you know, late in life. Um, anytime you touch a, something financial, drag them to the screen and, and have them sit in a chair with you while you've logged on to your bank account. You know, and let's say you've gone to the online bill paying area of it and just show them every month, maybe, you know, what you're doing. Um, I mean, now would be the time to include them. If it's been 30 years and they don't care less about anything financial, you know, if you're getting late in life, now would be the time to, you know, get them involved instead of just waiting till the very, until you, you know, here, here's a set of instructions after you're dead, because they're going to get totally overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. That's a very important point. I think you're definitely right. And I'm glad you mentioned Bill Gates, because I don't use that myself, but I, I should have made a point. Um, if you Log in. I don't even know how you do that. You log into your bank account and then the, a lot of times you can pay all your utility bills from there, right? I mean, I don't know exactly how that works, but right. I should have mentioned if oh, yeah. you use that, you want to mention I, that. I never send any checks or anything in the mail anymore. Yeah. No, it's all yeah. done online. Very important, Doug. Thank you so much. Uh, Lady Geek? Oh, okay. You, should, you mentioned Netflix. Let me talk to you about Amazon. When my husband passed, his he was actually the primary a uh, holder of a ton of Kindle, uh, Kindle books that we both jointly read. He shared a lot of stuff at, uh, under the family sharing thing. And also some, some of the services and video stuff. So everything was under his account. I had my, my account too, we just shared. But so when he passed, I called up, I actually had to call Amazon, believe it or not, it's possible to call Amazon, explain, they said, I have a death certificate, everything. He said, lady, <laughs> Just keep the two accounts. They, I asked them to combine all my all the shared stuff. They cannot do it. Long story short, yeah, yeah but you no. Know, so he said, look, it's okay. You can log into his account with his stuff. You, you just just go ahead and do it. We know we know it's a household. Just 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 stop there. No, sorry. No. So I now have two, I, I actually have two, two Amazon accounts. What I did do was change his credit card to mine, you know, just make it the same. And then I, when I re-upped Amazon Prime, I did it under my account. So, but the idea is Amazon cannot combine things that are shared. So just a little FYI, but it was okay to log in as his, with his credentials because it's a, it's a family thing. It's so. never too. Uh, Joe, uh, that was I appreciate the tip on Amazon. That so that was news to me. Uh, my personal problem was genealogy. I'm glad you mentioned that. My wife was very into genealogy, and she didn't leave any instructions on who, what I should do with all the research that she had done, and it it haunts me today um, that she didn't. I. I closed the account. I have no idea what happened to any of it. 
Um, but, you know, I had no, no interest and I ended up with, you know, piles of finished English dictionaries and English to Dutch dictionaries and all sorts of weird stuff that, uh, you know, genealogists would love, but it was just clutter to me. So this was one area where I kind of thought I, I failed her memory. So it, this is, you know, if you're into some, an esoteric hobby like that, definitely arrange for somebody to take it over. Good point. Yeah, because um, sometimes there's a, a cousin or, you know, something like that that might be interested where, it, you know, usually genealogy, you're either interested or you're not. So <laughs> that's a good point that you should kind of think all that through ahead of time. And um, maybe link up your tree with somebody else's so that all your, all the, you know, information in your tree that leaves out there somewhere, maybe some, something like that. So that's a good, good something to think about. All right, and see what else we have. Okay, taxes. So the important thing is, you know, document how you've been filling it out. Are you using uh, TurboTax, some of the other tax services? Do you fill it out by hand? Do you use a tax preparer? Which one, the contact information? And then where the past, you know, 10 years, I guess you only need three, but maybe 10 years are, are stored. Sometimes they may be paper files. They may be on your computer in a PDF that you save from TurboTax, that kind of thing. They may be with your tax preparer. So those could be important. Um, if we obviously want to use uh, notify the tax preparer in the case of death, because there may be some deadlines, you know, like RMDs and that kind of thing. Um, you, there is actually a deadline on um, preparing a tax return for the decedent, that kind of thing. Um, then there's also a couple other things that you may want to document that might be important. Uh, if there's a basis to your IRA, it's like say somebody has been making a non-deductible IRA contribution for many years and never rolled over to a Roth for whatever reason or converted to a Roth, um, that does carry over to the uh, inherited IRA. So that is important to know. That will save you some money. <clears throat> if you have a gift tax history, if you, you know, you've know you given money to your children or above the uh, exemption, you know the 15,000 or whatever it is per year, you do have to file, you, you would have supposed to have filed a form 709. And technically those are important because they get subtracted from your lifetime exemption if you go above the, of course now it's 11 million, but it could go back down someday. And you know a lot of bogleheads could be going above that amount. So if you had filed a tax form, a gift, a state ta gift tax form in the past, it would actually be important to have those um, forms. If there's any charities you contribute regularly, um, Especially if, the, if there's a case of a small charity that they, they're highly dependent on you, and you you would like to continue that um, as part of your legacy when you die. You know you can't force your spouse or your children or whatever to do that, but you can make a suggestion. I really want to support this. Uh, of course, you can put it in your will too, but um, that's just something to think about if you want to uh, support any any continue to support charities after your death in ways other than your will. Um, also, think about your HSA if you have a large balance. Um, if it's your spouse, obviously it just becomes theirs. Um, let's see. There, I did try to look into this top. I actually spent a couple of hours trying to figure this out, and there was uh, some information in the uh, Bogleheads Wiki that um, it's not quite clear if the spouse can reimburse themselves out of your HSA for expenses that you paid before your death. It's not quite clear, but it might be possible. So you may want to uh, have that information document. Most people, if they haven't reimbursed from the HSA, they have a you know, spreadsheet or something somewhere. Up here's all the expenses that were paid, but not reimbursed. <clears throat> um, so that's just something to, to think about. Um, is there anything else? Uh, Keith, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to mention a couple of things that you would want to document if something were to happen to you. Are you making estimated tax payments quarterly? You want you want your surviving spouse or, or uh, you know, executor, or whoever, to know whether you've done that or not. Um, and also keep in mind that you'll have a, you know, you'll have a, a tax return that'll be due if you've gotten income through half the year and you, you know, you pass away in July. So your surviving spouse is going to need money to be able to pay uh, taxes for you, depending on, you know, how everything's done. We just are, just went through this with our our mother with taxes for 2021. So, you know, those are things that you want to keep in mind that that need to be documented so that, 
you know, surviving spouse or whoever is able to take care of that and knows kind of the up-to-date information. Very important, Keith, thank you so much because I completely forgot about mentioning the estimated tax payments. That's very important because how would they know, they'd have to dig through all your bank statements for the, you know, I mean, how would they know that they may not know that you've made a large, you could have made a $10,000, you know, estimated tax payment and they wouldn't know unless you, so that's, thank you for mentioning that's very important. Uh, Doug, go ahead. Yeah, I'm thinking that, you know, that like this in regard to estimated tax payments and any other turbo tax, tax this, this whole slide here basically, and also, investment policies, all of that. If your spouse has just not taken an interest in it, I don't think you can document all this. I think you've got to make a transition plan to a professional to take your place after you're dead, you know, and, and, and maybe talk to them about what's going on and give them these, this information along, have a meeting with this professional along with your spouse with the plan that you'll transition to this other person after you're dead, the professional to take your place. I'm Very good that. point, because a lot of us, um, like I always do the taxes and I've been, for some reason, I've, I've always been interested in taxes. So if something, an article comes up on taxes, you know, I'll read, I'll read it. And so I've been just learning about this for 30 years. Um, so right. it's, it's, it's hard to forget how overwhelmed somebody that knows nothing about it is gonna be when you, like they're not even, they may not even know what some of this means. Like, what is a basis to write? Like, I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what, you know, they may not even know. So they may be completely aware. So I think it's a very good point that. They're not gonna know. And, um, and the reason they don't, they haven't been interested in it. Like right. you have been and I have been to kind of, you know, just out of interest. They don't care, they don't, they're not, they have other things you're interested in. Right. So you're gonna have to get a professional to take your place is my, my opinion. <laughs> That's a very good point in that. I, I don't think it's a bad idea to, um, even if you don't use a tax preparer, maybe just line one up and maybe just pay for an hour of their time to have a meeting. And then just kind of, like you said, um, smooth the path to for them taking over, you know? So that's definitely a good idea. Okay. Anything else on taxes? Okay, uh, this, the last thing in your book is going to be um, anything important you want to mention that your spouse may not be aware of about the house itself, um, you know, the names of like who, who services the heating and air, what's the schedule, you know, you have like, like we have every fall and spring they come and they service, we have a contract, they service the air conditioner and that kind of thing, you want to know who, would, who does that. If you have any handyman, a lawn service, plumber that you like to use, house cleaner, that kind of thing, you wanna have their contact information, um, what kind of like, schedule you're on for lawn care, that kind of thing. Um, any special filter, you know, that kind of, just, this is a, just examples of things that you might wanna mention, special filters that need to be changed, anything else kind of that wouldn't be obvious as far as maintenance on your house. Um, and then also as far as contents of the house, now some of these things are not, specifically financial, but since we're talking about all this stuff, it kind of goes, you know, goes in with all this kind of stuff. Um, location of valuable items, jewelry, coin collection, uh, firearms, et cetera. And this is non-financial, but location of important family mementos or sentimental items, um, family photos. And nowadays, of course, they could be physical photos, digital, digital photos on a computer, but they may not even be on your computer. They could be in the cloud. And um, these could potentially be important photos that, you know, you're some of your relatives, your kids, of course, your spouse is going to want um, to know where they are. So you want to document that. Then we have the whole category of social media. It's called the digital estate plan. Um, a lot of the companies like Facebook will have something called memorialization, memorialization settings where you could think about beforehand, um, you know, do you want your account just deleted, wiped out? Do you want it memorialized where you know, it's stated that you passed away, but then it leaves your page open so people could make comments and that, you know, that kind of thing after you're passing. So you just kind of want to think about that and then see if, you know, Facebook, the other ones that you're on, um, what kind of settings they have that you could possibly, you know, fill some of this up beforehand and get it set up. Um, going back to the genealogy, um, uh, you may want to just figure out what to do with that information. If there's another family member, if not your spouse, um, or maybe somehow merge your family trees in with somebody, one of your other relatives that you have a place to, to add on your portion of the family tree. Um, and then of course, the whole category is pet information. 
um, if you have any preferences, if it's not your spouse um, is not there to take your pet, who you know you might want to recommend almost like a guardian for your for your pet if they have any special medical needs. You know all, all that kind of information. Um, P, PJ, do you have you want to go ahead and share on this topic? Yeah, on the prior page, I think we forgot to include is um, if the estate has not finished with probate, you, you have to do annual tax return for the estate too, which, uh, you know, it, it's another thorn in the side. What I always say is if you don't like somebody, make them the executor of your estate <laughs> and don't have anything prepared and let them figure out life. So hopefully yeah. the uh, estate attorney would be helpful, you know, um, would be helpful with that and, um, and maybe even have a CPA lined up for that kind of thing if you don't already have one. So, but yeah, that is important. If it's open for more than a year, yeah, you would have well, to. Well, yeah, it, and you have to go through which assets remain in a trust that goes to the successor trust versus the things that have to be into the uh, person that died the state. And you don't want to spend uh, Two thousand dollars for an attorney for something that's worth fifty cents. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Doug. Yeah, this this valuables um, in slide eleven is important. In uh, firearms, uh, when my father passed away, he had a, a army issue forty five and a valuable German handgun called a Walther. They got during World War Two. When he passed away, my brother and my mother decided they didn't want that around in the house. So they called up Leisure World Security to, to get rid of these firearms. So Leisure World Security came over and took them away. I found out later they're they worth thousands of dollars. So you can lose thousands of dollars, you know, if you're not aware, if the person who's living is not aware that there's some valuables around the house. And also, there might be an issue. Like I don't know anything about firearms, but I there might be an issue is, issue where if it's registered to your name and you just give it to somebody else, it's still registered to somebody's name. And then if it's used in a crime, they could pretend. Is there an issue? Is that an issue where you want to make sure that it gets registered to the person that now has possession of it? Is that like a? An That's issue? a good point. I always wondered what happens to them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Miriam, go ahead. I just wanted to say that home ownership is a lot of work. And uh, I know we've lived in our home, we have a, a you know, half acre of land and my, we've lived here for 28 years. And my husband still asks uh, who, who are our lawn men, who are, what are the names of our lawn men? So it is, you know, your spouse, when you pass away, your spouse simply may not be able to take care of the house and may not realize how expensive it is to take care of the house. So, it's um, it's nice to include them while you're you know you're still around as part of the you know the the family work, but um, it may be a big it, it may be be a big weight on them to take care of a big home. Yeah, but even cleaning out. Um... That's a big job. And that's even probably even, you know, big job in itself, either just selling the home or cleaning it out and getting it ready for sale. That's so either way, either way, it's going to be a big job. Decluttering all your stuff. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Miriam. Any last call for um, comments on this page? See how we're doing on time. We're doing fine. Okay. The last page. So that's the end of the what we're going to call the book. Um, this is just uh, a list of different, a lot of it, some of it's online discussions um, on vocal heads. And a lot of this is stuff I just ran across when I was kind of trying to do, do a little bit of research and trying to make all my lists. Um, so, and then when we post this um, slide show, it's a PDF, these links will be live where you can just click on them. You can't click on them right now, obviously, but when you get the, or maybe you can, can you? <laughs> um, so at, when you get the slides, you can just click on these. Um, so this was just mostly Bogleheads discussions, a couple of other articles um, that were along these lines, some podcasts I listened to that were very helpful. Oops. 
a couple books that were mentioned. And then, okay, this last page, this is something that um, was in one of the, uh, you know, in the RSVP forum, somebody mentioned, you know, how do I get my, my encourage my parents to document, you know, because we're talking about you documenting for your spouse, but then there's also the issue of if you've got parents that are still living, you want to make sure they have documented them for when you're, you may be having to be the executor on their state. And sometimes people are uh, reluctant to even talk about it or or they may agree in theory, yeah, I'm gonna do it, but this is it's a huge job to document all this. So it's, it's difficult. So I ran across, there's a lot of articles and some of these were really good. There was a YouTube video. This podcast was really good. The, the first third of it was talking about this guy telling his story, what happened when his mom didn't have a will and all the, you know, you can only imagine what kind of issues you, you run across. And then um, the last two thirds was a woman who had written the, this book, this book called Mom and Dad, We Need to Talk, How to Have a Central Conversation with Your Parents about their finances. She was interviewed in this podcast about, um, you know, what if your parents don't plan and how to gently encourage. And everything that I've read was like, you don't want to make it about you. You don't want to be, well, you, you want to make, you don't want to be about them making your job easy. You want to be about, make it about you honoring their wishes and, making sure that you honor their legacy and their wishes. You kind of want to frame it in that, but even then it's going to be, it's, it's a, if they don't want to do it, it's, it's going to be hard to, to convince them. So I don't have a lot of, um, Keith, go ahead. Maybe you have some good advice. Yeah. I just want to, to add resources. I, I, I get the, um, oblivious investor, um, mm -hmm. email and there was a link to an article, what you need to know about estate planning from, um, white coat investing. And so I clicked on it and it was, it's gosh, I mean, I printed it out. It's a good, I don't know, 15 pages and it goes over in pretty good detail. A lot of things that you should consider. Um, and because I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm in the process of, of redoing ours. I'm using it partially as a guide. I apologize. I don't have the link that I can put into the chat. It was written February 12th of this year. So it's, it's, it's up to date and current. And it has a lot of great information on a lot of the stuff we're talking about in kind of a, a detail where you could, if you want, print it out and have it in front of you, maybe to follow um, and learn from. So I just wanted to throw that out there as another resource. Okay. So that was um, on the Oblivious Investor blog. Uh, it was, yeah, it was the, um, the email that he sends out. I, I probably got it maybe six weeks ago, four, six weeks ago. And he references and I, White Coat Investor, you said, or? And, and it came from White Coat Investors, yes. So it'll probably um, be on either one of those websites. Or it was uh, written by a Dr. James Dolly, D-A-H-L-E, uh, White Coat Investor founder. And okay. it's got a lot of great information on estate planning. Great. That sounds very helpful. Okay. Well, that's our last slide. So if anybody has any uh, final comments and then I'm gonna, we're gonna make sure we save the chat or we're gonna go over how to save the chat because there's a lot of information. Everybody's been entering a lot of really helpful links and information and stuff in the chat. Is there any just final uh, comments somebody wants to make about just wrapping this up overall? Um, anything we forgot to cover? Um, I actually would up. just, if I, can, if I can throw two things out there, just kind of maybe random. The first is, uh, at the beginning, somebody talked about when you move to another state, you want to make sure you update. That's absolutely true. And, and you know, we were just on a Bogleheads meeting maybe a month, month and a half ago where we talked about moving, relocating and retirement. So that perfectly fits with conversation that a lot of us are having. But I would also add if you have some kind of a change in your life, for example, you have a grandchild that you didn't plan you know, when you read it, written it uh, and when it was developed initially or, you know, something else that happened where you want to make some changes or tweaks to your state plans that weren't in there when you wrote them maybe a year or two or three ago. You start to have things like, you know, grandchildren, et cetera, et cetera, that get added. And all of a sudden, if you're leaving money, you need to make adjustments to that. The other thing I would just mention is to watch about tax changes that happen. For example, uh, there's a change to Roth IRAs for beneficiaries uh, in terms of how they have to be drawn down that's different from what it was before. There's other things that are you know, on the table or being talked about. 
So think about how tax changes that you read about in the newspaper or wherever you get your news from, how that might affect your estate planning or something that you already have written. Do you need to go back and make a, a tweak to it or a change to it based on something that changed that might affect how you want to pass your money down or, or what have you? Because you know, sometimes it can be pretty impactful dollar wise and you want to make an adjustment to that. So just a couple of things to think about as you're, as you maybe already have an estate plan, but you need to make adjustments to it.